so hello, good afternoon. Hi, Scott Sam. Uh, welcome to our very, very first Doc Talks at SPPJ. Um, I would like to invite our director of the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, more of them to start us off. Uh, 
uh, continue exchanging dialogues and interesting ideas in this uh, evolving effort, evolving institutional and community efforts on co-designing uh, a knowledge mobilization framework for the University of Virginia. So, um, you know, um, my presentation is going to be uh, around uh, uh, the outlines that have been created in my, uh, in my work, which is the context and research question, methodological approach, the strategic design method, research phases and outputs, the framework that we have been able to create, conclusions, and importantly, more dialogue, exchange, and discussion. So, let's start right off. So, um, discussions and deliberations about the importance of how organization. So, basically, is what do we do with the knowledge that is being created here at the University of British Columbia in order to impact broader sectors have been at the university for some time. So part of my research was really digging in and understand that the topic is not new, yet the integrated efforts have not been completely put on in a very uh, integrated institutional framework. So um, for this I went back to the uh, two previous strategic plans, which was Frank 1998, Frank 2000, as well as Place and Thomas 2012, as well as the Shaping UBC Strategic Plan, which was just released last year, in terms of really trying to capture and understand different notions of, of what the institution and its leaders have been thinking about benefiting different topics beyond academy. So uh, these dialogues, these collaborations uh, are still ongoing. And uh, the, a very interesting uh, aspect is that all these dialogues have been framed into one of the new strategic, strategic plans things, which is innovation. So you, the University of Virginia we aspire has been recognized as one of the best uh, or most innovative universities in North America. So, this innovation spirit also uh, speaks on how can we also better serve different audiences in addition to our internal uh, groups and stakeholders. So that led to uh, a broad question that meant to really um, organize a study in terms of bringing people together uh, to design a university-wide framework that includes structured systems and services that support knowledge mobilization here at UBC. And as we know that the research question informs the research approach, I decided to integrate uh, or take advantage of the strategic design method, which has been the intellectual contribution from Professor Quell uh, since uh, a decade of research, uh, starting at uh, Sutter School of Business, now translated uh, in, a, in a knowledge mobilization uh, academic way internally at the policy studio. So the strategic design method allows uh, a process of uh, user-centered participatory approach uh, in order to work with participants to, to discuss, co create tests, and propose resilient so solutions to big pictures or systematic challenges. And this is important to understand that knowledge mobilization is not just an intrinsic problem of UBC. It's a problem that has been uh, identified across Canada and across different countries that is still prevalent. So the notion of ivory tower is still prevalent. Even though we have advanced with different mediums or ways to how to connect better with different audiences, we still have a problem of being uh, quite isolated. And participants and the research were saying that UBC is not an exception. We have been quite isolated for some time, and knowledge mobilization efforts try to really narrow or narrow the gap of distance that exists uh, with different stakeholders. So just to give you a quick uh, overview, uh, strategic design really it's, uh, it's about working together, it's about uh, user-centered research that integrates three, uh, three phases of the model. The first is the asking about facts, it's really understanding the problem because it's usually used in complex problems that are not easy to identify and where uh, multi-stakeholders are, are, have a say in part of the process. Then it's about ideation, it's about creating, it's about prototyping, and that involved different uh, studio sessions with participants from inside. So we had some sessions here besides the NPR, as well as the UBC Robson side, as well as uh, in-depth interviews with some key uh, actors. And finally, to be able to build something, which is uh, the framework that has been co-designed uh, with participants. 
Um, research phases. Um, the whole research uh, took about three, uh, three years. That involves first, we started off with uh, gathering what who we knew were uh, professors, faculty, uh, staff that were working on different projects that had an interesting component of college organization. So the, fir the first phase was understanding uh, who is doing what. Who is doing what? Also, uh, importantly, talking about challenges and barriers that many, many uh, internal uh, community members have been expressing. Okay? Then research, uh, research two involved now going uh, into talking to who are our partners, NGOs, industry members, uh, government officials, uh, people from the general public, etc. Understanding what are the expectations for for them in order to be able to access and engage with experts in terms of benefiting more with the public research that is being here at the university. And finally, uh, the phase three is, uh, is narrowing down or strengthening the findings into a logic model that could help uh, the ongoing developments of the knowledge exchange uh, unit. Uh, this is a timeline of the process that started uh, in 2016 with uh, uh, the first uh, uh, designing of uh, understanding who was doing what uh, with, a, with an environmental scan. Then 2017 was pretty active in terms of working with internal stakeholders as well as working with external stakeholders. And as you might imagine, an action research project sometimes uh, timing and what comes first, what comes second, etc. gets really intertwined. So, this graph kind of speaks the ongoing interactions of the, of the research phases and methods. And here we can see important uh, landmarks because part of, part of the um, impact, I would say, of this research is about socializing the idea of the importance of knowledge organization or knowledge exchange as it is being now defined here at UBC. And for example, an important part was uh, August 2017, where UBC <coughs> joined Research in Canada, which is the leading network um, union for, for Canadian universities that are committed in terms of developing institutional capacities for knowledge organization. So that's, a, that's an interesting landmark. Um, we also had the opportunity to share some of these findings at the Canadian Science Policy Conference. And then we uh, started with uh, putting uh, the framework into something concrete and be able to uh, gather now uh, uh, people and champions in, in terms of uh, being able to concrete knowledge. So uh, research output one was an internal report that you can uh, take a look uh, after the event. Um, really understanding what were the uh, issues as well as opportunities that uh, UBC could uh, build upon in terms of working with our uh, people. And for this, the, um, the tools that I developed was the Knowledge Management Canvas as well as using case studies that are recorded in the research output. So this is the Knowledge Management Canvas that uh, was put to work with 35 uh, professors. Uh, talking about whether they have knowledge organization goals, whether they have a uh, um, clear understanding of what were uh, the impact, where the impact they were having in a specific project, etc. Importantly, what are the barriers, what are the challenges, and what are the opportunities? Because we have identified that these professors have been doing great work, but this work can also be enhanced if we have a more integrated. Uh, the research output too was uh, a report uh, that integrates the, in, the inside findings as well as the external findings. And this is a piece of, uh, well, I, will, I say my, my research is a knowledge organization that includes knowledge organization components because part of the information or the data that is included in this report is the actual suggestion that came from participants on saying we need to have a concrete unit or a structure that will speak for the framework that is being created. So basically, we have enough data, we have interest, but we need to concrete into something, uh, in 
to something as specific. So UBC has uh, taken now bold steps in terms of being able to materialize uh, knowledge exchange. And now we have the privilege of having the first director of knowledge exchange that uh, we will have, uh, that uh, will have uh, the official kickoff uh, this May, this coming May. So it is a process of ongoing developments happening here at UBC. Uh, for this um, research uh, part, I use empathy maps and service journeys. And empathy maps is uh, really understanding what are the expectations from the different participants, really understanding where they're coming from, uh, what are some of the pain points, particularly while accessible research or while engaging participants. Some of them are saying, well, we need wayfinding, we need to we need to know who is doing what and from an external point of view. It's like we get lost in you. We understand it's a, it's a high intensive and very, very complex organization, but we need more understanding how can we navigate through the system. So these are some of the uh, some some of the feedback that we receive from, from different participants based on a positive actual or a possible experience. As well as we uh, put participants to work into what type of systems or what type of services they might be expecting. And, and we understand that there is a diversity of different actors that might be accessing research, uh, but we also need to understand that uh, we are in an era of uh, innovating with services. So we need to really step up and, and provide something more uh, user-friendly oriented. So um, um, service journeys speaks of pre-service elements, service and pre-service elements. And finally, um, um, I was able to put on um, a preliminary, uh, what was called a circle or advisory committee uh, that speaks of the diversity of, of different um, internal element, internal um, um, actors that we have, like professors that uh, come from different uh, faculties, as well as staff, as well as uh, grad students that were speaking from different points of view. And through a decision-making kind of canvas, uh, we were able to, uh, to propose into a more structured way of, of what the framework would look like. And this is the, this is the last output that uh, speaks about a logic model on different areas that have been developed and have been published in the output, basically on different notions of brokering, training, uh, strategic leadership, liaison, etc that will also support the ongoing decision making process. And this is a high level uh, view of what the framework is about that starts with the people, starts with recognizing the uh, motivators as well as the barriers that some of our internal stakeholders are experiencing as well as the external actors in terms of accessing or engaging the UBC. Then uh, we also found out that, uh, well, knowledge mobilization is a social process so we need to be more uh, uh, intentional in terms of the places where knowledge mobilization or knowledge exchange happen. So there is an important consideration of really designing or redesigning a space where these knowledge mobilization events could happen because it, it won't happen just online or something. It could happen online, but uh, usually we're, I mean, we, we exchange information and, uh, and we need to have more welcoming spaces for that. Then we are in the process, or it has been identified, the process of integrating some programs and services in order to streamline the opportunity to be able to disseminate and exchange information. And finally, we also need more research in terms of prospective research assistance. And for example, we have developed a broad agenda on further research for national decision here at UBC, as well as, as with our network of research. So conclusions of my research. Um, first, um, this research has contributed to the exploration, understanding, and conceptualized knowledge mobilization here at UBC using a concrete framework and action-oriented uh, model. Then uh, it has expanded the literature and knowledge mobilization systems and the structures that could benefit universities. So part of my research was talking to leading authors uh, here in Canada and abroad, and they said, well, we, we don't have, like, we're just an anecdotal information of how this uh, process has happened, but there is no actual research on that. 
and your research is uh, showcasing uh, the, the ongoing process and the actual period on the knowledge uh, exchange unit that will happen. It also has contributed to the development and application of the uh, application of a strategic design method as a uh, as a method that is uh, quite useful in terms of bringing people together from different disciplines, from um, um, experiences that are able to integrate the process of critical thinking as well as, as creative thinking into something that is uh, that it's an output, that it's a shared uh, experience and shared uh, outcome that is being created. And finally, um, a broad agenda of research that we need to go further with uh, researchers here at UBC as well as researchers abroad on notions of how we're going to be measuring impact, how we're going to be incorporating new technologies, uh, how, how can we boost uh, uh, the processes that are happening here at UBC because uh, knowledge mobilization is not just about creating something new, it's about integrating, it's about working together, it's about aligning some with different uh, programs and structures that, that uh, currently exist. So that will speak about uh, organization and change making processes that uh, will happen in, in, in the following years and here at UBC. So now, uh, time for questions and clarifications and comments. Thank you very much. But we might take one question <coughs> So I have a question. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, here we go. So my question is this. Um, the proposal of the framework, how is that for you to design and coordinate uh, this proposal and get it sort of out? Well, the proposal of the framework came from participants saying, um, we have expressions of interest here and there, etc. But we need something more concrete, so we should come up with a framework. And then at that time, like uh, 2017, uh, internal members were saying, well, we want something else. We don't want just a traditional structure, etc. Because um, uh, UBC, as a major research university, uh, suffers from silos, suffers from uh, why do we create another structure or unit and then we'll get inside of it and say that. So the first conversation was we need to have this framework, but eventually then they were admitting, well, if we just have a framework then it's just going to be kind of like a plot and say that, that some people kind of do this and do that and say that, but we need to have kind of like a unit that will concentrate on the global operational like that. So the framework uh, kind of like got track and said, saying, okay, we need a structure. And, and uh, the KX unit is going to be hosted at uh, the broader unit called Innovation UC, which is, speaks about the spirit of this framework and the spirit of people that are excited to, to see innovation to action, particularly well, the action of, of including different stakeholders into, into the process of, of creating the research well, uh, it was uh, it was a uh, uh, challenging. It was uh, a great kind of like uh, approach, but I think uh, that uh, eventually you know, I think it paid off. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
proliferation of party elite messages. His third paper uses an experiment to demonstrate that anti-intellectualism consistently conditions the persuasiveness of scientific consensus cues. Dr. McLean. Content relevant to expert consensus 
actually featured a message from an expert related to that consensus. And only in 2% of cases was there actually a clear signal that this was actually a consensus or widespread opinion in the expert community. This varies across issues, as shown on the screen here. On the left, you see the most frequent use of expert messages, so vaccines, climate change coverage, not that surprising, but it, the story gets bleaker as you move to the right of the graph. But even still, uh, in light blue, which is not showing that clearly there, uh, the consensus cues, even for vaccines and climate change coverage, not that common. This isn't a very common journalistic practice. And if anything, this overstates the case. This is content relevant to the expert consensus, but not all the stories that I downloaded had actual content relevant to that consensus. So for example, on immigration, on the economics of immigration, not all stories about immigration talked about the economic benefits or costs of immigration. So when these results are presented as a share of total news coverage on these issues, the story is much, much bleaker. On the other hand, false balance isn't as common as we might expect. Only 22% of stories contain some element of citing contrary experts or scientists. This is most common in GMO and nuclear power coverage, but is not all that common across the board on my other issues. Comparatively, it is much more common for journalists to cite polarizing opponents, so parties and interest groups that oppose the expert position. This was done 42% of the time. And polarizing allies were cited 48% of the time as well. And this is more common in economic issues like farm support and the Federal Reserve, but it's still pretty common on most of the science issues that I looked at. The only exception is vaccines, which is very depoliticized in news coverage. Climate change is a bit of an anomaly where a lot of polarizing allies are cited, like the Democratic Party, but not a lot of polarizing opponents. So the news media does not do a very good job covering expert consensus. It's not very common. It's clouded in politicization. But on the other hand, uh, climate change is a bit better than the other issues in terms of how it's covered. But nonetheless, we know that Americans and Canadians to some degree are polarized on their attitudes towards climate change along partisan or ideological lines. And why is that the case? And this leads me to my second problem that I identify in this thesis, that of political party elites. We make the argument in this paper that citizens, partisan citizens in particular, learned the positions they wanted to take on climate change from cues sent by cues or messages sent by party elites communicated through the mass media. And this is consistent with a wide range of literature in public opinion formation and political science. Uh, and we make a distinction here between in-group and out-group queuing. In-group queuing is where you follow your own party's leader, and out-group queuing is where you're repelled by leaders of the opposing party. We ask in this paper, are party elite messages in the news media correlated with aggregate levels of climate skepticism after we control for a bunch of other factors that we think are important based on academic literature? So to do this, we construct an automated content analysis of over 25,000 climate change news stories from a wide range of sources. We measure party cues with a dictionary of keywords and phrases, and this allows us to identify articles that have references to party elites in the content. Uh, and about 80% of these references actually signal a stance on climate change, so most of these are pretty valid. Um, I, this graph here shows the increase in party cues over time. The dashed black line is the total number of party cues, so rising to over 50% of news content on climate change. And this is driven in particular by democratic elites. We measure public opinion on climate change, climate skepticism in particular, um, with an aggregate measure based on 172 publicly available polls going all the way back to 1986. We construct an annual measure of climate skepticism, that's shown on the left, starting in 86, and we use a quarterly measure starting in 2001. And as you can see, climate skepticism, skepticism towards the science of climate change, has gone up over time. But unfortunately, those measures aren't broken down by party. So we supplement those measures with the Partisan Climate Change Threat Index from Carmichael and Brill. It's quarterly as well. It starts in 2001, but it's broken down by Democratic and Republican parties. And in this measure, it's the perceptions of climate change threat felt by each party's respondents, 
So Democrats are in blue, Republicans are in red. You see the gulf that exists between the two. On the right is the polarization between these two measures. And so since 2001, polarization in the American public has approximately doubled. So we estimate a series of models that predict these changes in aggregate climate skepticism and attitudes towards climate threat. And our, we find that our most consistent predictor are messages from Democratic Party elites. It, they predict attitudes towards climate skepticism, Republican attitudes towards climate threat, and overall polarization. And together it suggests that there is an outgroup queuing effect going on for Republican identifiers. They are being repelled by the signals sent by Democratic elites. There's also some inconsistent evidence that Republican Party identifiers are supporting their own party as well. To get an even clearer causal story of this, uh, this is all correlational, we wanted to run an experiment as well. So um, we gathered a survey of almost 3,000 Americans. Um, we randomly assigned them party messages from either the Democratic Party in favor of climate change mitigation and the, or the Republican Party opposed to climate change mitigation to see what causal effect that, that has on attitudes towards climate skepticism. So the horizontal red bar is no effect at all. As you go above that bar, people are becoming more skeptical about climate science. As you move to the right, those are Republicans. And so you see, when exposed to these cues from party elites, whether Republican or Democrat, Republicans become more skeptical about climate change. But for Democrats, there is no effect. So there's some evidence of asymmetry. Party elites matter. Now, climate change is a quintessential example of an issue that's very ideologically charged, but on a lot of other issues of expert consensus, that's not the case. Uh, and so that leads to the, maybe the third problem I identify in my thesis, that of anti-intellectualism. Some people might just be skeptical about experts and expert advice. And surprisingly, this concept hasn't received a lot of attention. Um, I treat it here as a fundamental or generalized mistrust of experts and intellectuals resulting from a disdain of scholarly and intellectual pursuits. And the implication is pretty straightforward. To the extent that trust is required for persuasion, those that have anti-intellectual views should be less persuaded by expert consensus when it exists than those that are more trusting of experts. To test this hypothesis and a bunch of others in this paper, I gathered a sample from Amazon Mechanical Turk, about 3,600 Americans. I measure anti-intellectualism with a battery of trust questions related to trust in different communities of experts, not just scientists, but economists and lawyers and, uh, and lots of others as well. And I construct a zero to one index that I show on the screen here. Uh, past 0.5 is where you become very highly anti-intellectual. That applies to about only 20% of Americans, but that's still a sizable number. We should be concerned about that. I chose four issues with some strong scientific consensus and evaluated the extent to which respondents supported each of these positions. They were overwhelmingly on side with climate change, Republicans aside, uh, but much more mixed in their opinions about the other three issues that I selected. And here's where the experiment comes in. I randomly assigned people into two groups. In one group, they just gave me their opinions on these four issues. In another group, beforehand, they were told that there was a scientific consensus that existed on each of these issues. And so I expect the persuasiveness of that message, that cue, to be weaker among people that are more anti-intellectual. And that is what I find. Um, the results are shown on the screen. So again, the horizontal red bar is no effect. If you're above the bar, you're becoming more supportive of the scientific consensus. If you're below the bar, you're becoming less supportive. And on three of the four issues, this result holds. All, all things considered, if you are most trusting of experts, you will be persuaded by expert consensus. But that persuasiveness declines as anti-intellectualism rises such that people that are the most anti-intellectual actually double down in their opposition to support of expert positions. So they become even less supportive. And that was found on all four of my issues. So taken together, the analyses in my dissertation highlight the need for scholars to take the information environment seriously. For starters, we can't simply assume that citizens are exposed to information from experts. We put a lot on the average citizen. We expect them to be informed about things, but the media doesn't do a good job of doing that. 
My findings show that signals from expert consent about expert consensus are exceedingly rare in the media environment, even on high-profile issues like climate change and even in news content that is directly relevant to that consensus. And so that should be a wake-up call for both experts and journalists. For experts, we need to do a better job assembling consensus documents to, to guide journalists in their coverage of these issues. It is very hard to find this information, and journalists are pressed for time and need a little bit of assistance. Journalists, for their part, need to do due diligence when they're communicating positions from experts. Is this the opinion of one expert, or is this the opinion of the broader expert community? They need to do due diligence. And we need to account for the fact that signals from experts are often communicated to citizens in a polarizing context. Vaccines are an exception to this, but on all the other issues that I studied, this is a staple of news content, and it might block the persuasiveness of experts among highly motivated citizens. But it's not clear what, if anything, we should do about this. Areas of expert consensus have a lot of relevance for certain economic and social groups, and these voices deserve to be heard in news coverage. But nonetheless, journalists should carefully evaluate whether it's necessary to carry these sorts of information when also communicating positions of expert consensus. We need to exercise more caution. These findings also show us the limits of ideology-driven motivated reasoning. It's just too static. When we think of motivated reasoning, motivated skepticism, we tend to imagine people are locked into their beliefs and their values. But our analyses show that cues from party elites uh, are strongly associated with climate skepticism over time. And our experiment shows the same too. Republican hostility towards climate science was not necessarily a foregone conclusion. And party elites may have a role in depolarizing Americans as well. We can't just simply assume patterns of opinion that we see today are locked in and a fait accompli. People move their opinions and attitudes in response to trusted sources of communication. And finally, these results suggest we need to be skeptical and cautious about grand ideas of persuasion. So science communicators have kind of latched on to consensus cues as a, as a way to break through ideology-driven motivated reasoning. And I think these cues are important and might persuade a lot of people that consensus exists and we should move their opinions accordingly. But nonetheless, we know that consensus cues may potentially backfire among a sizable portion of the public. And so we have to be cautious about unintended consequences of certain persuasive strategies. Find ways of breaking through them as well, and that should be an agenda for future research. That's it. Thank you very much. So I used public opinion data of communities of experts. So 
Uh, there's been a lot of effort recently by economists to survey professional economists about their opinions on various issues. Um, some issues they exhibit some form of consensus on, others they do not at all. Um, so I relied on those sorts of polling, that sort of public polling data. There's also a panel of, of experts that's uh, uh, held at the University of Chicago School of Business. Um, so they, they survey the, the top site political uh, sort of economists uh, in the field and they give their opinions on different policy perspectives. So that guided, those guided my selections of those issues for economics. For science, uh, meta-analyses, basically. Um, I, there's been some meta-analyses done on uh, GMOs, um, showing that they're more safe, at least compared to conventional alternatives. Um, so that, that sort of information does exist. Um, the same for nuclear power. And again, for nuclear power, it's compared to dominant conventional energy sources. So uh, nothing safe, perfectly safe, uh, but compared to fossil fuels, nuclear power is much, much safer. So uh, I looked for meta-analyses to confirm that. So basically that's, that's what I did. Um, but again, to my point, that information is very hard to find. For the, like for the average journalist that needs to put a story out there, they shouldn't have to do that much work. So we need to do a better job getting that information. So I'm just, just to finish that one point, I'm, I'm what, one, what you might call an expert on nuclear power, right? Uh, and I agree that nuclear power is quote unquote safer depending on how you define safer. Yes, right? well exactly. Yeah. So yep. for most news stories on nuclear power, I think it is perfectly correct for the journalists to point out there is no consensus on whether nuclear power is safe. If you're using safe as there is no danger, then yes. Right, but that's what people want to know. People don't want to know whether coal is safer or nuclear is safer, and it depends again on what safer means. But you don't think that's an important element? No, I don't think that's important. I think but it's a really good dialogue piece yeah. for a I just want to sort of, yeah. Because I think that, I think the journalists are actually right on the mark on things like GMOs, nuclear power, and so on, because I'll give, uh, explain why I'm getting to this. What you define to be an expert on, let's say nuclear power, right, is usually an engineer or a physicist or something of that sort. Yes. And they have no expertise on whether accidents happen or not. Accidents is a area of expertise of sociologists, organization theorists, people who study accidents. Same with GMOs. Somebody who's an expert in plant breeding is not an expert on whether GMOs are good for health or bad for health. And I think that's the problem with how this the uh, word expert is defined. Sorry. Good point. Uh, sure. Sorry. Thank you for your question. Is it anybody have to leave first? I'm sorry? Oh, I was just asking if anybody had to leave. Academy 
sometimes uh, acting functionally towards those uh, interests or not, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's just no, no, no disagreement here. Cool. Okay, thank you very much. are, we're looking at people who are coming from highly affluent, highly educated, 
um, professional backgrounds who are displaced because their homes are turned into rubble due to civil war, a political conflict, this sort of thing. So essentially, they live lives like we do somewhere else. It's very hard for people to sometimes uh, intimate with that sort of detail, that there are people who are high functioning in communities that are well developed and that can turn into rough dust and rubble very, very quickly. Um, so, actually, before I do that, when, so this sort of, uh, this sort of tragic sort of scene sort of stands uh, in Syria from the Arab Civil, um, Arab, uh, Arab Spring that caused the Civil War in Syria. Um, it caught a lot of attention, of course, globally, and Canada was no different. So there were people emailing MPs, um, writing letters to their government saying, how can we or how should we um, help? How can we invite people over? And so Canada in 2050, right after we had an election, um, the federal government said, okay, we're going to bring over 25,000 refugees now from Syria. And so they did that. Um, our largest in British Columbia, the largest settlement organization is called the ISS of BC, so the Immigrant Services uh, Society. And they probe, so we, any, any refugee that comes into our province gets, um, uh, goes through them. So all the paperwork and everything is managed through this organization. So they have the data and the contacts to be able to reach out to every single government assisted refugee and say, how are you faring? How are you doing in British Columbia? And it didn't turn out so well. So 30% of people were still sad or using the word depressed to describe their own well-being of theirs or their children's well-being. In the literature, we see that in the absence of mental health support services, there is an increase in mental distresses, increased isolation, diagnosis, and of course, time on financial aid. There is also decreased integration, economic contribution back to the community independence and well-being. However, when we start to have and see the presence of mental health supports for people, we see improved mental wellness, overall well-being, uh, increased integration into communities, so we work school community, um, yeah, work school in the community involvement. We look at volunteerism in community centers also. Um, you see increased language adaptation, employment, and then economic contribution back through taxes. So this led to my three research questions. The first was, what formal and informal mental health services were offered to support GARs, government-assisted refugees, during the first year in Vancouver? And then built into the second question is, what gaps were present in formal and informal mental health services for GARs during that first year in Vancouver also? And then the final question is, what policy recommendations can be made to help improve GAR mental well-being? So one way that you can look at your research if you're thinking about working into sort of uh, PhD level research is how do you strategize, how do you look at the theories that are going to be informing um, how you look at a particular problem. So we have this thing that is a wicked problem. A wicked problem comes from um, the design theory, strategic design, this idea that there's a problem that's too big for it to be for it to be belonging to one person, so there are multiple owners of that problem. This idea that the problem can't be solved in one shot, that it takes iterative solutions and kind of cycles. Um, so we have a wicked problem that is refugee well-being, right? Who's involved? We've got the settlement sector, we've got politicians, we've got community members, we've got people who are inviting refugees. And we have well-being theory, this idea that well-being can be improved for people and that we can actually measure it. We have strategic design, this idea that we can build solutions for any problem. It's a solutions orientation framework. And then that all of those theories kind of lead back to our proposed theory. And hopefully, the policy recommendations can be used to feed back to the wicked problem to create some sort of beneficial cycle. I use this another way to sort of look at this funnel. So what are the contributors of this thing that is the wicked problem? So low well-being, a lack of mental health services, and then multiple sectors that are involved. Settlement sector, mental health sector, um, and uh, politicians, so the public sector. So the data collection is absolutely interdisciplinary, so it's bringing in um, threads from different theories. So we've got interviews, so we're looking at open-ended data collection. We have roughly about uh, 40 hours of the interview, which is a lot of transcribing and a lot of written data. Um, and then we use the service journey map, which is a cool way to kind of look at how the service is um, 
use, uh, uh, what are the feedbacks? How does the service work from beginning to end? It gives us a lot of data on that. And then very directly, I used key informants. So key informants are people who um, have a very specific type of knowledge over a number of years, and they integrate that knowledge, and they're able to put it out to research. This is an example of a service journey map. So it chops across time, across population, across service. So you get a lot of data and something like this. It could be really And bridging now into impact, so sort of like looking at finding. So um, like Eric, we used content analysis, something called computational frequency analysis. So this looks at, in an interview, what words are common, what surfaces, what ideas are important, because what that does is it tells you, from a key performance perspective, what they're looking for in a service. So that's really, really important. So the data that comes out, we were able to subcategorize it into three major categories, so policy and education, communities and families, and the health and well-being. So some words that key informants are using when they're talking about policy and education are things like government, federal, policy, free education. Uh, for communities and families, we're looking at war, migrants, immigrants, refugees, persecution, and torture. And then, of course, health and well-being, we're looking at things like health, diabetes, and so the access of health care. If you think about presenting your research, this is a really cool um, method of knowledge translation, um, knowledge mobilization, also using a word cloud. So this actually just helps to visualize what were the largest words, the most common words coming up in the data collection. So out of policy and education, government, federal, and student, and then in communities, you settlement of immigrants, and then out of health, we'll be using IFH. IFH is the acronym for Interim Federal Healthcare. That's the free um, healthcare that refugees get in their first year of arrival. So further, um, after we did the content analysis, so looking at the interviews, you can subcategorize them even further and look at latent themes, latent themes, so things that are below the surface. Um, there were four key themes that came out of this research. The first is that mental health services need to be seen as a priority for the members. They have to be, they have to be right at the top when we look at integrating families, single individuals, couples, and children. How are we looking at the mental health and how are we addressing it? Uh, we're looking at services needing to be settlement informed. So if we're looking at English classes and getting people to access and attend English classes, are we looking also at, do they have a house? Are they still in a hotel? Do they have bus passes to access English services? Are there um, daycare uh, services available? Because lots of these families came um, with children and they people weren't able to fulfill their English requirements just because they didn't have daycare, simple as that. Um, we also noticed that mental health care needs to be available for all refugees. So there are some instances um, of politically driven and uh, politically charged where uh, refugees could access mental health care, so counseling services. Um, however, that funding got cut just a year before the election, so just before the Liberals um, uh, went into power uh, in 2015. In 20, at the end of 2013 and 2014, they cut funding to all government-assisted refugees, and counseling was only provided to asylum seekers. So that's like chopping that pie really small, so that's maybe like less than 10% of refugees were able to access um, any type of health, just because that funding was covered right before. So availability to all refugees, not part and parcel of it. These refugees can get services and these can. And then the last idea was that mental health services can be collaborative. So looking at social workers, mental health care, so the English, the ELL providers, um, different sectors including mental health, um, settlement, and public, and convening them so that their services are actually working and integrated together. Um, at this stage, so once the data is sort of collected and you've got some sort of findings, you can kind of map out what your next step is. So if this was how we sort of looked at um, analyzing to analyzing to produce computational frequency analysis, and the next step is to find the thematic findings. The last step is to formulate the policy recommendations from that. So that's another way that you can sort of think about mapping your own research. And this is kind of a plug for you guys to do more research in this area. So <laughs> the future research by you guys could be um, on other sectors. So I use three, so I use settlement, mental health, and the public sector. You can do like education, you can do um, frontline staff, um, 
like RCMP, people who are in border patrol, like um, people who are meeting refugees firsthand. We do also do budgetary stuff. So you can follow the money. You can look at what portfolios um, have the largest amount of money and how effective are they being. You can also look at programmatic areas, so English programs, housing programs, settlement programs. All of these areas are really well researched. And it will help because when you're looking at different populations, all of the other pieces kind of start to come together. And it shows us how we can improve so that when we replicate this study, <laughs> um, you can kind of look at the gaps that are existing. So this is really about moving stuff forward. So we found this information, but it's not the end of the story. There's so much more to come, so much more to do here. So some of the benefits of the study is that it can be replicated not only in our province and in our city, but in other provinces and in other countries as well, because there are lots of countries who are taking in refugees and maybe not be monetizing and sort of um, budgeting their experiences based on what's happening. So looking at what's, what's effective and what's not. Um, building empirical knowledge, um, the study also uses interdisciplinary methods, which is so helpful because it bridges different types of professionals together. Um, there is hopefully room for some sort of policy reform, but policy recommendations are just coming up. And then future research in so many different areas um, so that we can develop best practices because this problem of refugees, the problem of civil war, the problems of poverty, are not going anywhere, unfortunately. So we're having more and more people being displaced every single day. So how do we improve this for these people, the segment of the population who are coming into our communities? Um, this led to the policy. So this is my first, this is the framework. So this is the federal settlement platform. So its components include housing, English classes, health, financial, identification. So people who are coming uh, to the country who may have lost their ID cards because they were hanging on to the undercarriage of a moving vehicle or the inside of a tire or hiding in cargo. So people who didn't have identification. So looking at the mental health, this has um, the most of the policy recommendations. And then, of course, we'll give education and employment for this group of people because people who are coming in with graduate degrees, years of professional experience, and lots of um, income and lots of money that we could bring into the country just because of banking services they were at the So, some of the policy recommendations um, that I'm suggesting here are to fund that national unifying um, web based platform so that people who are on their way to Canada can meet with, interchange with, um, and exchange information and dialogue with some of the professionals who are here locally. So that's the first, that's the large, um, the large uh, ask here. The second ask is to recognize registered clinical counselors as service providers. So I didn't get into this very deeply, but it's, there are mental health professionals in the province who want to do work, who are licensed to do the work. However, they don't fall under budgetary categories that allow them to do the work it's a very minute political issue. So uh, there are certain colleges and certain professional organizations that sort of uh, do the bulk of the work and don't want to share that workload. Um, so recognizing people who are available, costs less, and have the skills to do it, it's a really great idea to tap into that population. The second policy recommendation I have is to upskill any current mental health professionals who do fall under the category to provide services but don't have the skills to do it. That's a really easy ask. The fourth one is to design mental health curriculum for higher education. That means that for upcoming teachers, upcoming social workers, upcoming um, counselors, psychologists, build in that curriculum piece around refugees and refugee well-being is necessary. There are more and more people coming into our communities with this experience. If we have that sort of in our back pocket, then we're already equipping our next generation of uh, the fifth is to extend federal services for one to two years. One of the problems we saw was that newcomers weren't able to finish their language courses because they were full. So we're mandating them you have to come to this class and take these courses, but we only have 30 spots and there's 60 of you. We didn't set it up very effectively. If that happens again, in, in the case, hopefully this doesn't happen, but in the in case that we have a large, um, large movement of people coming in and a large cohort, we need to be prepared to have that sort of um, service available to them. So, and if we don't, can we extend it to another two years instead of just saying we're cut off? 
And then finally, engage community members um, to kind of engage. So that means incentivizing this. So does Matt Bailey Stadium have some sort of government program where they can invite baseball players from whatever country to kind of volunteer and teach baseball to kids? Um, does that same sort of process happen at the PSO, the Vancouver School? Um, uh, PSO? Oh, orchestra? Orchestra. Orchestra. Symphony, Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. Um, yeah, so how do we link opera singers to the orchestra uh, so that we can link them together and increase their integration, so into incentivizing this last piece, so really arranging the communities together. So that is, I think, where I close. Thank you so much for this opportunity for listening.
policy recommendations regarding anything is the idea that we have to make trade-offs. So in the sense that we have finite resources, and for any government, even for a developed country like Canada, you have finite resources, and you cannot really do everything you want to do for the well-being of the people you're trying to serve. So in terms of that, I'm thinking well, about the policy recommendations you made, all of those need significant increase in resources. So federal services from one year to two years, more mental health support services, all those things. So I'm thinking, have you thought about maybe the cost effectiveness or what are the trade-offs in terms of which are more effective than others, even though all of those are effective in some way? That's an excellent question. So in fact, I don't talk about it in my presentation, but I do in this. So this resource uh, series is literally for passing the torch to future PhD researchers. So I talk about, I broke it up into well-being for refugees, uh, how to do interdisciplinary research, and then policy recommendations. So in the policy recommendations, I do cover trade-offs. Um, and in fact, because of the portfolio uh, for our federal government, IRCC is literally just on top. It's at a national level. So any funding resources that go down to the province with regard to British Columbia, we don't have a refugee portfolio at our ministries. So it has to get funneled through a different portfolio. So it goes through um, jobs and tourism. So when monies are coming federally to provincial levels and it's getting split in a different kind of way, the management of money changes and then the allocation and entitlement of money also changes. And I do talk about uh, the funneling of monies, maybe in dollars to programs, and I also talk about trade-offs. Um, with regards specifically to policy recommendations, it's true. Anytime we're talking about either adding or shifting something, that's a, that's a, sh that's a pull on resources, whether it's human resources or uh, capital, um, or uh, dollar capital. Um, and what I do is I talk about how we can shift the resources that are coming in, because there is funding coming in from uh, various portfolios through the ministry to fund these services, but they may not be effectively so it may not be about generating new monies, but in fact, we allocate maybe a little bit more tight on how we're spending our money so that, in fact, whatever we're putting in does come back out with how it exists through taxes, through contribution, and migrants and immigrants. Thank you for that question. But that is this. So typically, these books on Amazon are 20 each. We're students, so I did three for 25. <laughs> That's for today. So I hope that, that answers that question. Any other questions? We have time for maybe one more. No one else wants to no. Yeah. Okay, so this is for Eric. Cool. So what I'm like, so maybe it's similar to what Professor Roman was talking about, but one of the things we have on the slide is trade. Mm -hmm. So I study economics, I'm an undergrad in economics, and when I read newspaper articles about trade and the benefits of trade from the economics sense, oftentimes I think the consensus is not a black and white thing, right? So when we code data or do the analysis, oftentimes we have to do it in a binary sort of way. Is there a consensus or not? If it's if there is a consensus, is it good or bad? Yeah. But most economists would say trade is good, but only if you take care of the losers. Right. Or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is a very different thing from saying there is a consensus that trade is good. Right. So I'm curious to know how you coded the data, maybe in yeah. terms of those issues and. Maybe it's better that these sort of articles often have those anecdotal evidence or uh, like stories from the communities which are most hard by trade, yeah. which may give the impression that trade is not good for everyone, but maybe those are the stories we want because yeah. those are neglected yeah. in the academia. Yeah, so, so for all, all of the economics issues I said, there are always winners and losers to certain public policies. That's, that's a given. Uh, and you, I don't think you'll find, except on the very far right, any economist uh, worth anything that would say that there's an unquestioned benefit and that no one would face costs for things like free trade or um, uh, opposition to rent control or things like that. Um, so unfortunately, the news articles don't do a good job at portraying nuance, which is not surprising, right? So I think, mo I think there's a consensus among economists that free trade is good, um, but that should compensate the losers uh, through redistribution and, and things like that. So I think that's where the consensus is. Unfortunately, the press doesn't do a very good job of covering that second part of compensating the losers. Um, and you know, in, in another project, uh, I'm, you know, I'm planning on delving into each of these issues in a bit more depth because I, I had to code in ways that I could compare across a bunch of different issues. 
I want to do a bit more depth in terms of what and how, especially for free trade, how that's covered. And I'd want to go into more detail on that, because uh, you're absolutely right. Okay, maybe last. If, if you do have to leave, just please make sure you fill up your uh, feedback form and you can leave it at your seat. Um, maybe we'll take the last two questions. I have a question. Oh. So, your research is on the level of plantation, and this event is an excellent platform for that. So, our knowledge is mobilized from you guys to us. So, ideally, what should happen now? Now that we have this knowledge, what should we do with it? Okay, so, thank you for your question. So, um, I mean, for for good is that uh, I mean this project has been uh, spurred by the institutional interest in order to integrate uh, different programs and services that exist. So uh, we're going to have a remark in sorry, May 15, the official launch of the knowledge exchange unit. And um, one of the one of the key issues that we have been working with the faculty and uh, staff. Is that how knowledge mobilization efforts will be enhanced or will be um, motivated or rewarded? Because we know there's a potential. We have the experts. We have the experts. But uh, usually, uh, knowledge mobilization efforts have been something like on the side of the events, something that is great to do, but not necessarily scouted, like talking about a following perspective on the direct promotion. So one of the one of the key uh, findings was that uh, is there was a strong and an unanimous and unanimous consensus that um, knowledge publication activities should be also counted towards the promotion. So hopefully uh, through the integration of this framework and the launching of the KS unit, we'll really signal and kind of really work together and saying we we'll need more recognition as well as resources, as well as guides, how to engage in info the media, how can we train uh, new generations of grad students in order to mobilize their finances, etc. So there is an action going on, and uh, these are very interesting times for our university. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, final question. Here we go. A short one, maybe. Oh. Marcel, thanks for your research and your work. It's a uh, very timely, I believe, and I, I imagine a lot of people believe that. So it's really urgent. Um, I, I, just, I just was wondering, maybe this is too complex to explain right now, but maybe just describing the, the main axis or the central um, areas or the central criteria upon which mobilization is being defined. I mean, just to understand, and that may be in parallel with the areas that are being emphasized, how would you describe in short terms? This is a great and complex question to solve because part of the part of the complexity is how we define knowledge mobilization because there are different terms that are being used interchangeably. So, for example, it's the knowledge exchange, knowledge mobilization, knowledge translation, knowledge dissemination, science communication, etc. So, part of part of the uh, approach to work together with this uh, group of many to was to be really open to different perspectives because uh, we we were uh, inclined to say this is going to be the definition we're going to use and that automatically limits the, the, the type of number of participants. So um, we have been quite inclusive in, in terms of uh, particularly being sensitive that uh, different disciplines come with sometimes a uh, very fixed notion of what knowledge organization is. So um, one of the complexities of the framework is to be is to be as inclusive enough and not to be prescriptive on this is going to be the definition. For good or for bad we have the shared definition which is the social sciences and social council definition of knowledge organization that is very clear that speaks about the internal knowledge that happens between disciplines as well as the knowledge that happens between universities and different actors. So it's actually both ways, uh, internally and externally. But uh, we were careful not to be too um, uh, prescriptive of saying this is kind of the definition because we actually want to hear from different perspectives. And many participants were saying, well, uh, 
Actually, I was hesitant to be part of this because what I do is not knowledge conversation. What I do is community engagement. I said, well, for this community, community engagement, it's also a very knowledge conversation. So uh, we were quite uh, open on trying to be as inclusive to try to incorporate different views. But the question and the research on can we recombine to one big definition? Part of the research agenda, and hopefully you will see them. There are many actors that are excited to say, okay, how close or how different are we in terms of finding a, a more unified definition? So more still to come. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending our very first job talks at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Um, I just sent Pat through the paper for uh, names and email lists. Uh, please do engage with us. Uh, you can write your name and email and we will be attaching it for our next event, uh, which will be the latter half of October of uh, this year, so the next semester of October. Thank you very much.